Hey guys, and welcome to another very special episode of Costa Rica Crypto. And today I have the honor and the pleasure of speaking to somebody I've watched for a long time in the background, Mr. Thomas Cox. And I was initially introduced to Thomas um, when I first started kind of following EOS, but recently on an Ignite interview, um, Thomas had come out and said that he will not decline any interviews. So I kind of sent him the invitation saying, hey, I'm not going to hold you to that. Um, but at the same time, I'd love to have you on the show. And of course, um, here we are today. So I guess my first question to you, Thomas, is why would you say that you're so approachable? Like, well, I noticed that you speak to a lot of different people about, about EOS and, um, and you, don't, you don't discriminate. You, you seem to, to be able to want to have a chat with absolutely anyone. What kind of drives your approachability in this space and why do you continue to do media engagements? Right. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, a bit of an introvert. And so I, um, I find parties really draining, for instance, um, but public speaking is actually um, much more um, safe. It's more controlled. Uh, it's much easier to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation like this and forget the audience or to be on stage in front of an audience with a prepared talk. Uh, and so I'm actually quite good at that. I've been practicing that. Well, I was first paid to speak um, in 1991. And so I'm, I'm practiced at, at that. And so for me, the approachability that you see is a very particular kind of, of outreach. And I also, I asked myself a while ago, if I were to do my role, the absolute best it could possibly be done so that, you know, looking back on it, I won't have to say, wow, if only I'd done more X, what do I need to do to bring 100% to this? And governance is my focus. And unlike code, which runs on computers, governance runs inside people, right? You have to believe in it. If you believe in it, then it works. If you don't believe in it, it doesn't work. That's just, that's how the governance beast is. You know, if everyone woke up tomorrow morning and stopped believing in the government of their country, the government would fall. And if they wake up believing in it, then it stays. Um, and EOS governance is, you know, one quarter code and three quarters people. Uh, and so I knew that to make governance work, I had to be out engaging with people and listening to them closely and watching their faces and noticing when they get confused or when they go, no, that's not possible or it doesn't work that way or what, whatever the feedback was so that I could both tweak the governance content to fit how people work and also tweak the communications of how it works so that people could get it. Uh, and that's been my full-time activity since uh, I shifted over. Um, Dan Larimer and I talked about this, I think, in January, uh, that I needed to work on governance pretty much full-time, um, that being the VP of product for Block One, it's, it, in a way, it's a little superfluous when you've got Dan Larimer, who's got the entire product concept in his head, that having a product guy is like, I could carry his hat for him if he wore a hat, but I'm not sure what other what else I can do. I drew diagrams there for a while trying to explain Dan thinking to the rest of the world. That was very popular. <laughs> uh, but governance was this huge part of the offer. It was all over the white paper and there wasn't a team on it yet. So I headed up that team. Um, and as I say, governance runs in people. So I had to engage with people very proactively, repeatedly, uh, intensively, and I still do, because governance is not out of its infancy yet. Uh, EOS governance is still, um, we launched, I would say, a little prematurely from a governance perspective. I mean, we launched on time from a, when we said we would launch, you know, end of the ICO, uh, we would go through these steps and, and release the code to the world and the community could create a, a snapshot, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but everyone expected three or four things to be in place that weren't there. So until things are more solid, I feel for me to have integrity with my intention and my commitment to the community, I've got to stay engaged in governance well and, until it is ticking over like a, uh, a BMW idling, like just this nice smooth purr. And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. For sure. Um, I've noticed so that that's why the approachability, that's why I will, I will repeat I, any podcast, any interview, if you've got an audience of three or more, I will come on your show 
and I will talk about EOS governance with you. I love that. I don't think that that's something that runs with a lot of people in your position. And I think the fact that you see that when you see that um, it's a benefit to, to mass adoption is a huge thing. I, one of the things I wanted to ask you was this. Was there like a particular aha moment? Was there a conversation? Was there an event that happened in your life where you reached out and you thought, EOS, that's for me? Was it, what was it that kind of spurred your initial involvement? And how did it take you to where you are? Yeah. Um, so back in August or September, no, June or July of 2017, right when the project was taking off, uh, a guy named David Moss was hired by Block One uh, at the strong recommendation of a bunch of people who knew him. Um, Dave Moss is an amazing guy. He's the fellow who took Edmunds.com from like four or five guys working out of the pool house of the founder out in back of his mansion to 140 staff and a website pulling in millions of dollars a month. And he did it in 14 months. Now to go from a concept and a handful of guys to a well-functioning software delivery team of 140 people delivering a highly successful commercial product in 14 months, that is not a skill set you find, you know, under every bush. That is a hard skill set to find, and Dave is extremely good at it. Uh, I worked with Dave back in the 90s. He and I worked together when, right after we both left Oracle Corporation, with, you know, the big database company. Uh, and so Dave and I known each other for a couple of decades now. Uh, and I have enormous respect and affection for him and he seems to tolerate me pretty well. So, uh, I was the first person he recruited to work for him when he took the role, uh, to run the software process for, uh, for block one. And it was simply a matter of him saying, so, um, I could use some help here. Here's this blockchain project thing. And I'm like, block what? <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, because I, 15 years earlier, you know, around 2003, when I was, uh, I took one of the layoff rounds from IBM and got a, a severance package and set up my own shop. I really shifted away from technology and over into leadership and management consulting. Because uh, I wanted to see how do you run projects from a people perspective, not just a technology perspective, uh, which is an area of fascination for me. And so, to, you know, to be pulled back in a way into the database world, but forward into this incredibly breakthrough technology is amazing and delightful. And I get to bring all my people skills with me. So um, yeah. that was the, that was the call was from Dave Moss. And I, you know, can't say yes fast enough to, to an offer like that. And that was before I realized, you know, who block one was and I didn't really quite get who Dan Larimer was. And so I stumbled into this incredible opportunity. Uh, and my goal has been to live up to it and to be worthy of it and to discharge my, you know, what feels to me like potentially historic responsibilities uh, as best as I possibly can. I think um, it seems like everything you've kind of done in your life has is, is ultimately led you to this point. There's been, yeah, I haven't mentioned two other things that are relevant. I have a real fascination with game theory and, um, and also with politics. I was the libertarian candidate for governor of the state of Oregon in 2002. Uh, I, so I've been in like retail politics trying to you know, get votes and deal with donors and deal with voters who have you know, fascinations with topics that whole thing. And then the next year I was the state chair of the Libertarian Party of Oregon. And, you know, I've helped with get collect signatures for ballot initiatives in the state of Oregon. We have a very robust direct democracy with um, the voters putting things on the ballot every year for uh, direct democracy. And we'll, we'll grab things that the legislature has passed and call it for referendum to see if we really agree with it or not. Uh, so this whole referendum thing that we're rolling out on the EOS uh, governance space, uh, which, by the way, was intended to be ready before we launched and we just didn't get to it, which is why we're sort of struggling here with this, all these interim solutions that haven't been ratified. There's not a ratification process yet. Um, but a lot of the folks working on referendum haven't thought through some of the stuff that I've lived through in the Oregon case where what happens if you put up two referenda and they contradict each other 
and they both pass. All good points. All good We've points. had that. We've had that multiple times in Oregon. So, um, and the short answer is the one with, if to the extent they don't conflict, you do them both. And to the extent they do conflict, you follow the vote, the one that got more votes than the other one. Interesting. That's, that's the short. Now, what it doesn't tell you is more votes by percentage or more votes by number. And the answer is percentage. Um, but if you had a massive turnout and a thin margin of victory for one and a tiny turnout and a massive margin of victory for the other, you'd think, well, the big margin should control it. It's like, no, the one with more yeses controls it, even though the margin was smaller. It's a very weird stuff. And, you know, there's depths to be explored here. When I say that the EOS ecosystem is, is young, I mean, we've yet to have our first fully evaluated um, and final uh, arbitration order come out. We've had our not yet had our first arbitration order executed by block producers yet. We haven't had our first referendum yet. We haven't had our first referendum challenged through arbitration yet. We haven't had our first arbitration order challenged for uh, uh, appeal yet. We haven't had a block producer fired yet. We haven't had one disciplined yet. When I say fired, I mean um, not just voted out, but some of the other processes. There's, all sorts of things that we can do that the code allows us to do and that the rule set allows us to do, but we haven't actually done it. And I promise you, it's like your first kiss. Until you've done it, it's a great mystery. And it's a little, you're, you're full of uncertainty. Uh, and we have to go through it. We have to suffer through the unknown. And then the fourth or the fifth or the seventh time we do it, it'll be like, oh yeah, we, we're, this is, we, we understand this, this is normal. But the first one is going to feel freaky. And part of the reason people are a little more squirrely, frankly, uh, than I think they should be on governance is just because it's so new to them. Um, they haven't lived through it yet. We haven't done it yet. Uh, and that kind of uncertainty brings up people's fears and doubts. And it's always that way. It's the monster under the bed. I wonder what will happen when. It's like, eh, Sounds like it's, we've got an interesting year or a couple of years ahead. If I were oh, yes, I promise you. And then whatever does happen, there'll be factions who will shriek that it's the wrong thing to have happened. And that's all, no, not like that. It, it's unavoidable, but it's also going to, it's, it's also ultimately going to help the project. And it's yeah. And if you're used to being in technology and you're really, you know, you're a code person and then this kind of like yelling from people kind of freaks you out. Um, that's why I highly recommend going through, you know, going running for election. Uh, you kind of get used to people yelling at you. <laughs> You're a candidate. You become a projection object and you realize it's not really about you. It's about them and their unresolved issues or their hopes and fears for the future or their, you know, hidden agenda or whatever. It's uh, it's funny. I, this isn't the today is not the match show, but I've actually been in a position um, in a previous career that's very much that way. I I want to just regress a little bit. It seems like um, like you've you've reached a certain amount, a certain measure of success in your career here, and I know that you have a lot that you want to overcome in terms of you know some of the things going on with Elas. But I guess in in the in lieu of people kind of trying to get to know where you came from, were there any formative memories? from your youth that may have kind of projected you or pushed you to the level of success that you've already achieved today? Um, I would say maybe not my youth particularly. Um, there wasn't a moment, um, but there was a, a conviction I somehow grew into, I, I think in my, in high school, maybe even grade school. Um, where it became clear to me that everybody was the hero of their own narrative, that nobody's setting out to be a villain, almost nobody. And even the ones that are trying to be villains will also are also trying to hide that. And so they want to pretend like they're heroes too. But really you can pretty well be guaranteed that most people are honestly doing their very best most of the time to do what they think is the right thing. And if you think it's the wrong thing, then back up a minute and try to understand how would a heroic person be doing that? 
like what's the positive virtue that they're you know standing up for when they do this annoying difficult harmful thing for instance you got somebody who's constantly saying no and the group is ready to move forward and this person's like no 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 and they seem obstructionist right um odds are good they foresee a problem that others don't foresee and they're trying to prevent the team from plunging the bus into a ravine and crashing it and killing all the occupants and when you say, so I'm guessing you're, you're foreseeing some problems that you, you're worried the rest of us don't foresee. Would that be fair? And they're like, yes, yes. And they feel so relieved to finally be understood. I find that's a very common pattern. It's just one of many. And so the rule that I started to incorporate is um, everybody's actually trying to do the right thing from their own perspective. And if it doesn't seem like the right thing to me, I don't know their perspective yet. And if I can just like shut up on my own opinion and ask them about theirs long enough and with enough openness and curiosity, first off, I'll get a lot of credibility with them. They'll finally get that I get them. Secondly, when I, when I talk to them, I won't be doing it in utter ignorance of whatever's animating them. And third, they often know things I don't know. And suddenly I'll go, oh, my God, you're right. There is a, a concern here. It's not as big as you think. Uh, and here's why. But at least I took the time to listen first. And so I have enough credibility. That they'd be willing to listen to me. Uh, it's like the old Stephen Covey advice. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. It's incredibly effective. So I always teach people assume positive intention Assume that people are really doing their best and they honestly are making a good faith effort to, to do what they think is right uh, and approach them with that expectation. Um, it beats the heck out of assuming that the person's a jerk or evil or wrong or obstructionist or you're just trying to destroy the team, uh, which gets number one, you're wrong and, and they know you're wrong. And then when you, you know, float this wrong thesis, they're like going to double down on what a jerk you are. It doesn't persuade them. Uh, and number two, it creates additional new issues that slow down understanding and prevent your team from moving forward. So assume positive intention. And the other thing you should do is get to know your teammates as humans, which is what we're doing on this call right now, uh, which is why your show is a tremendous service, I think, to the community. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. I, um, I do this because I'm passionate about it. I do it because I love it. And um, as a non-techie, I got dragged into the wormhole a little while ago. And it's been a been a really cool journey yeah you think i'm not a programmer how do i contribute and the answer is you do all the other stuff that people aren't doing because the programming's not everything programming's in some ways less than half the total work absolutely and, and your governance work speaks on speaks on a lot of that i think um in in kind of in the same light um people want to get to know who is thomas cox so i'm going to shoot this off at you it's a very low level question but i think people want to know and then we're going to move on to some deeper stuff what do you do for fun? What do you do when you're degassing? What do you do when you're, when you're just trying to put everything away and you just want to go and de-stress? Um, well, I, I have the great good fortune to be married to my best friend, uh, Tess. And so I am almost certainly doing something with her. Uh, last night I finished off work around 7 or 8 p.m. on a Sunday and Tess said, let's have a, a glass of wine or a beer. I'm like, yeah, let's do that. And we just sort of, uh, there's this thing called flaneuring. Uh, if you ever read uh, Anti-Fragile by Taleb, uh, wonderful book, highly recommend the book, Anti-Fragile. Uh, a flaneur is someone who sort of meanders. They just sort of mosey. They're not super driven to like, I, I must have an itinerary of 27 places to visit in Rome in one day. It's like, you can't enjoy Rome. It's like, what do we feel like doing in the moment? Let's sort of, meander that way. That's mosey. Uh, Tess and I are both very driven in our work and we get pretty intense. So shifting into this sort of moseying mindset is fun. Uh, and so one of my favorite things is to do have a flaneur day with Tess and we'll just like pick a hotel, a really nice hotel, and then we'll go hang out in the lobby and we'll people watch and we'll read books and we'll play games and we'll like, Oh, Hmm, what's nearby we'd like to visit or is there a, you know, a, gallery opening or, you know, we'll just kind of make it up as we go. We don't heavily schedule things. 
I think that's, that's a great way to relax. So highly recommend the Flanur approach. I love it. Um, I tend to do that with my significant other. We, uh, we do a lot of traveling and we kind of do that too. We'd never, oh, nice. schedule. we just, we'll go somewhere, we land, we Flanur and uh, just go kind of check things out and take it as it comes. So that's, yeah. a, that's a great response. I love that. Well, because when you're super goal oriented, you're not really letting in the outside world. You're actually ignoring everything that isn't your goal. And then how do you experience the place you're in? And a, a flaneur is much more aware and present and like you pick in the smells and the, and the, the, the sights and the sounds of, of the, of the place you're visiting. It's uh, makes for a richer experience. I think. I'm joining the, uh, the Thomas Cox movement and I'm going to start flaneuring more often. But- the uh, Tassim Nicholas Taleb movement. Uh, he's the one who introduced me to it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to check out the book. Um, I want to move forward here a little bit and talk about some of the reasons that I got drawn into the wormhole. And one of those was that I'm seeing a lot of projects coming out that have some really interesting socioeconomic impacts, like the, the possibility to do some really incredible things. We're not talking about moving money around so much anymore. We're talking about changing the social landscape of the way that we function and the way that, that the world works. Um, how do you think that EOS can be used as a tool to create change in the world above and, and beyond simple money transfer? Um, and I guess, do you have, is, are there projects out there that you're very interested by or do you have a favorite project that's currently happening? Yeah, uh, I think this is a great question. Um, one of the reasons that you've mostly seen money movement as the, the default applications in version one and version two blockchains is that's what they're excellent at. And it's about the only thing you can do with an, an unpermissioned blockchain that's not governed. See, if you don't have a governed blockchain, then anytime the code behavior separates from the code intention, you just get the behaviors correct, right? The code is the law. Oh, you didn't intend to like have the parity wallet destroy $300 million worth of ether. Well, that's too bad, but it did. Uh, And there's no coming back from that uh, in an ungoverned blockchain. And a governed blockchain is intended to be a place where you document through Ricardian contracts, the intention of your smart contract. And then you can go to an arbitrator and say, Hey, wait, this did not, execute like we like we intended and you can check that and the arbitrator can rule on the execution and say you're right parity wallet code did destroy your ether but nowhere in your ricardian contract is it says the intention is to destroy money <laughs> there are contracts burn contracts that are supposed to destroy money but this isn't one of them okay clearly the execution differed from your intention uh, as your arbitrator, I order that this be rolled back um, in the sense that I transfer the money out of the destroyed contract into your, back into your account. And then the block producers would have the obligation to carry that out. Uh, and that requires a four-sided game that um, you don't see in the unpermissioned world, right? You know, your Bitcoins and your Ethereums, it's code and market forces, code and market forces. That's it. Two forces are in, are, are in play. And in a governed blockchain, you've got code, you've got market forces, you've got legal forces, and you've got social forces. All four are in play. Uh, and that was explained back in the late 90s by Lawrence Lessig in the new Chicago school model. Uh, that predates blockchain and Bitcoin by 10 years. Uh, so he was talking about how internet systems work. It's the same model, though. I mean, it's the same reality. And so we're the first, and by no means will we be the last entity to harness all four forces to try to uh, create a coherent whole that handles more uh, exceptions, handles more cases. What that lets you do is move more interesting work onto your blockchain. It's not just the money transfers. It's the longer-term contract. It's the... Uh, I want to have my test loop application uh, run on a blockchain. Test loop is a Tesla renting company in Southern California. Uh, the one that's got me most excited is uh, Irio, I-R-Y-O. Irio is a medical records um, company. They don't put the record on the blockchain. They use a blockchain to store the access control permissions, the access control list so that in this publicly viewable but 
uh, permissioned blockchain, I as a patient could authorize you as my doctor to look at and even update my medical record for the duration of my visit today. And then when the visit's over, you lose your access to my record. It's my record. You don't own it. You can't sell it. You can't aggregate it. It's mine. Uh, and the same approach could work for um, credit histories, right? You see where this is going? We're talking about empowering the individual to own and control access to their data in a big and mighty way. And they use some very sophisticated and interesting zero knowledge proofs and other work. Uh, there's a related thing I just recently heard about from um, the uh, Digital Currency Initiative out of uh, MIT Media Lab. And they have a, something called the ZK Ledger, uh, which is a way for an auditor or a, uh, a regulator to receive uh, provably true assertions about the status of your accounts without seeing any of the data in your account. And so you could be, you could have all your regulatory compliance with no disclosure of particular detailed information. I think that that's amazing. I won't. That's uh, wild. Yeah. That I've, is so cool. I've got a couple of projects that are very, that I, I follow and, and I'm very interested with, I, I won't bring into here because this isn't about me, it's about you that are doing exactly that and, and have kind of control over information. That was actually my next question. My next question was, I was going to ask you how important is it, to own your own information? Uh, I, I think it's vital. I think that um, we have a, an information economy that's just going to grow in power and importance. And when you don't own your own information, um, you're, di you're deeply disempowered. Um, and that's how we're able to see, you know, Facebook, uh, Google, even though people largely like and largely trust them, um, I don't think that blind faith or blind trust is wise. And ultimately, you know, the power resides in whoever has control over the value, over the, over the, whatever the thing is that's being bought and sold. And corruption comes about because of concentrations of power. And if we can move power back out to the edges and away from the center, uh, we're going to make for a, a more just and a more virtuous world. Uh, and also a more effective world, by the way. I, I mentioned my interest in management consulting. There's a tremendous series of books. One's called uh, Freedom from Command and Control. Another one's called Turn the Ship Around. There's a whole series of them. The theme is that to make your organization uh, a better competitor to others, the trick is not to move information to the center of power more effectively it's to move the power out to where the information is, to empower the frontline worker, to empower the work group, to give decision-making authority as far out as you possibly can, which requires you know, those entities to understand the strategy and have aligned incentives and um, be respected and be given excellent training. When you do that, you end up with organizations like Bertsorg and other teal organizations that are highly decentralized, highly autonomous at the worker and work group level uh, and deliver incredible quality uh, and are lower total cost than their competitors and yet have higher margins of profit. And it's an amazing uh, result that comes from the systemic empowerment of individuals and in, in work groups. Uh, and I think that owning your own data um, combined with the discovery, the rediscovery of the importance of empowering individuals and, and frontline teams, um, that's the future of competitive advantage. And I think blockchain is going to have a big role to play. I, I agree with you. It was funny because I watched your interview in depth when I was doing some of the research for this with Martin. And you mentioned, you mentioned something that really kind of struck a chord. I also caught the fact that you're, your background was in psychology, but you mentioned that a lot of the time with technology, it's not the technology itself that causes the division. It's actually, it's the people who are talking about the technology, allowing it to, to be able to make, you know, to be able to make use of it properly through communication. How's your, yeah. how's your background in psychology influenced uh, some of the work that you do today? 
Um, it's funny. I got my undergraduate in psychology at the University of Chicago because it appealed to me. I wanted to be a well-rounded person. Um, Chicago has an excellent core curriculum, still does. Uh, you can't graduate from Chicago without being at least exposed to some of the great books uh, and expected to be able to demonstrate your ability to think for yourself, to reason. Um, and that's, to me, one of the greatest uh, benefits of getting any kind of advanced education is learning how to think better and communicate really well. Um, that's what I got out of the undergraduate degree. And also, um, my original uh, exposure to psychology my freshman year uh, was with a, a class that was taught by a guy, Israel Goldiamond, who took a very scientific method approach. I mean, he was a rigorous scientist. Uh, and the scientific method is the only structured and systematic way I'm aware of to control for human frailty and all of the many, many cognitive biases that humans are prone to. Uh, and so if you have an, a, an outcome that's really important to you and you're not using the scientific method as, as, the, as the operating system that's controlling you, you're in trouble. You, you've, you've got to subordinate yourself to a system that works and the scientific method is one that works brilliantly. Um, and then your, your goal should not be, I claim to chase outcomes. It should be to tweak the system so that the system delivers your outcome reliably and repeatably. If you are not a systems thinker that the 21st century is going to pass you by, and we're not teaching, I think, enough people to be systems thinkers. The good news is if you can be a systems thinker, you can create amazing results. And um, that's one of the things people copy is the behavior of successful people. So I'm hopeful that that uh, message will come through. Would that be in alignment with kind of your definition of perfect productivity? Or what is perfect productivity to you when it comes, when it comes to being as efficient with your time and as efficient with your concentration of energy as possible? Yeah, I've got, um, I'm going to have to double down on my, my thinking on productivity because it's been one of my, you know, as somebody who was a management consultant, I, I coach CEOs and, and senior executives. And one of the big issues always was productivity uh, in team leadership. And there's an excellent book by a guy named Pozen, P-O-Z-E-N, called Extreme Productivity. That was very good. Uh, and I'm revisiting that because I recently took on a second job. In addition to working full-time for StrongBlock, I'm now a part-time executive director for the EOS Alliance. And my rationale to my boss was and is that, um, number one, StrongBlock is squarely in the EOS space, and we need EOS to be a success. And secondly, my role in StrongBlock is all about governance and this is like getting, you know, a second job where I just get better at my first job because, you know, governance is all about wrangling the people uh, and listening to their concerns and helping them understand how to find a path forward for themselves. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very busy. And so to me, perfect productivity is not doing the things you don't need to do. And of the remaining things you actually need to do, doing the most important ones first and having your first draft be as good as it possibly can be. So you don't have to do too many second and third drafts. Uh, Posen actually has a, an excellent writing uh, chapter, how to write rapidly with high quality. And I realized I was actually doing most of what he recommended. I just didn't know there was a method for it. So if you need to get more productive, Posen's book, extreme productivity, highly recommended. I will be checking that out because um, I've, I've, I, have a, I have a little business on the side. And of course, I'm doing these videos. I'm a pretty busy guy myself. And productivity is my number one. Um, is my number one focus that I really need to start working on to be a little bit. Yeah. Stop doing things that aren't yours to do, um, especially things that you maybe you enjoy or that help you hide from your problems. Uh, one of the ways people get uh, an emotional payoff from being busy is it fills your attention so you don't have to face the things you're trying to avoid. That's some solid advice, my friend. You spoke briefly of having a second chance to be able to do the same job. I'm going to ask you a weird question. You don't have to answer it, but if you had a mulligan or a redo for any one particular part of your life, whether it be for a good reason or a bad reason, 
uh, what might that be? If you could do one thing over that you've done, maybe it was an epic flub or maybe it was a complete success. What might that be? Um, you, you sent me, thank you for sending me the questions in advance. And I had no idea how I was going to answer that question until just now. Um, I only late in my career realized, um, not just the importance of people to, to effectiveness and productivity and people's skills now that I've learned enough to teach them. Um, but I also didn't really uh, understand the value of relationships or even how to be in a, uh, a good colleague or, or friend particularly. I mean, I wasn't a bad friend, but I wasn't good at the whole friend game. I was, a, I love technology. Leave me alone. Let me program. Um, and now that I'm in the senior executive ranks, um, everything's a people issue. Everything's about recruiting, right? You don't have a supply chain problem at my level. You have a supply chain management problem, which is a people problem. And how do I empower you, my logistics person, to solve the logistics issue? Um, or how do I replace you with someone who's capable of solving this? Because uh, I can't reach in and solve it myself because I don't have the time or the bandwidth and probably I'll not have the knowledge. So now that I've come to this place where people and relationships are the primary currency, I, if I had known that and if I'd had the skills I have today back in college, I would have gone through the University of Chicago like learning who my my classmates were and what their strengths were and what their dreams were. And I could have stayed in touch with them and I would have, um, you know, an, an even more amazing professional network than I have today. I think I really only began building up my network in the last five or 10 years. And that's the best time to do anything, start anything is 10 years ago. Uh, you know, think of the things you, you wish you'd done 10 years ago, started flossing, uh, Regular exercise, good diet, building out your professional network. Um, and it is not that hard if you want some good guidance on how to build and maintain a good professional network. Uh, Manager Tools is my go-to resource for that kind of thing. Manager-tools.com. They are the gold standard for the nuts and bolts of being a good manager. And that includes building out your network. It's interesting, and I think a lot of this stuff is gold. I'm hoping that anybody who's watching this is writing this stuff down because I have a feeling if it's gotten you to where you are today or at least helped you in some way, it can probably help a lot of other people too. Um, I guess I'm going to go with kind of the standardized question here. What is the idea of – what is your idea of success in a utopian world, maybe briefly for yourself and then briefly for EOS? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm very skeptical of, of utopias. Um, the – the history of utopian movements is a history of oppression and murder. Uh, people who try to create heaven on earth end up creating hell. And I think part of that is because humanity are, we are designed for struggle. We are designed for um, having goals and struggling to face them and having surprises and setbacks and an unknown future. And most utopias are about getting rid of all of that and having infinite leisure and no problems or risks or issues. And if that wouldn't drive you nuts, you're not human. Um, and I think it's better not to wish that, that life was easier, but rather to wish you were better because you can't make life be easier, but you can make yourself better. And so to me, um, Developing human potential and working on your yourself, your self-control, your good habits, your um, self-awareness, um, that to me is the path of enlightenment. And um, there's no technology that's going to hand that to you. But there are technologies that can alleviate needless, stupid human suffering like hunger, uh, you know, gross material want, uh, the fact that we still have people on the planet living on, you know, pennies a day is... Uh, an atrocity. Um, and I think that the path forward is going to involve empowering those people. Uh, there's a, an essay and possibly a book about the, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid that the people who are living in the greatest poverty actually pay more for staples like rice or soap than you and I pay. Like, why would they pay? What? 
how can they be, how, first, how can, can they pay more? And secondly, why would they be paying more? And the short answer is there's so much fraud and corruption and waste in the supply chain getting out to that, um, into those parts of the world um, that it exerts an enormous uh, cost increase. Well, fraud, waste, and abuse are by definition avoidable, eliminatable, and should be. Just as you know, having a potato rot on the way to market benefits nobody. You know, having fraud and 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 corruption raise prices for the poorest people on the planet is just appalling and atrocious, and should be attacked. And I hope someone makes a very handsome profit attacking it. I think the profit motive uh, for for people who are not committing fraud. Uh, is one of the greatest positive forces on the planet. It's a fantastic answer. Um, and that kind of ties in a little bit with my next question I was going to ask you. Um, and as well, just on a note, I've talked about it before, but I've seen a lot of the, my, my experiences from traveling is that um, there are a lot of people out there who have absolutely nothing and they are happy. And that to me has been one of the most blind, mind blowing things that I've experienced since kind of moving um, south. But my next question was, it had to do with kind of integrity. I know, I know that that's something that's very high up there. Um, obviously, it's something that a man in your position has to conduct himself with. When you go to deal with somebody else or when you go to enter a relationship with somebody else, whether it's business or personal or whatever it might be, um, how important is integrity? And do you have any red flags that might stand out um, in a first conversation? Yeah, I don't know what my red flags are, but I would say that, you know, integrity is its one of those words that we love to throw around along with accountability and trust that are often used but seldom defined. Uh, I'll give you a technical definition of integrity, and that is that your words and your actions match. And to the extent I struggle with integrity, it's because I say yes too quickly. Um, or I say yes without defining what it is exactly I'm going to do, or I say yes without really thinking through how much work is involved and what I'm going to have to say no to in order to make the time and the space to finish the yes I gave you. And so my ongoing struggle is to um, not rush to yes um, and to, you know, if I want integrity from others, I better show it myself, and that includes, um, you know, that kind of self-control, that kind of... Um, not, not getting all starry eyed and impulsive and go, Oh, I can totally see how we can do that. You know, and you just, you just imagine the happy path in your mind, but it's never the happy path. Okay. It's always, there's always detours and struggles and landslides. And no, the time estimate in my head is not the time estimate that will work. And you'd think I'd know that by now. Uh, so I, I need to, to have that and I need to continually, you know, pull myself back from excessive optimism and my time estimates and my yeses. And what that lets me do is also be skeptical of other people um, and notice when they're saying yes prematurely, because that's just total kryptonite. If two, you know, impulsive, quick to say yes, people get together and think they're going to do a business. Oh my gosh. Uh and so, yeah, one of my red flags is um, really simple. It has to do with scheduling. You know, if I say we're going to meet at a certain time, do you show up on time and are you prepared? Am I on time and am I prepared? Uh, I had one guy, we kept trying to set up a meeting and neither one of us could make it. For the, we like, rescheduled it five times. And I finally said to him, I don't think fate wants us to talk. <laughs> and I suspect at some level, the two of us really didn't want to talk or we would have found a way, maybe. Um, Great so, yeah, I, I look for simple, simple indicators of reliability, um, mm -hmm. kinds of things that uh, impulsive, opportunistic, um, untrustworthy people actually struggle to do, like show up on time and prepared and be patient and listen to the other person. Uh, they often want to spin you a line and talk real fast. That's a great answer. Actually, this, this whole interview has been really, really good. I'm really enjoying speaking to you here. So I do have another, another few quick questions, and then I'm going to probably try to close things off, not for my own time, but particularly for yours. You have an empire to run out there. Um, I think what is, what's the thing you enjoy most about the EOS community in kind of like one short phrase, and then what would be the thing that you enjoy the least? 
Um, I really love the, the cooperative nature of, of the EOS community as distinct from the Bitcoin community. Bitcoiners tend to be more, much more antagonistic um, and much more belligerent. Um, and I think that might actually be entirely appropriate for them because they're on an ungoverned public blockchain. And there are very few cooperative moves uh, in, in Bitcoin. There's plenty of ways to rip each other off. And so, yeah, they're skeptical, extremely skeptical of each other and of anybody else. Um, they remind me, frankly, of bond traders on Wall Street or my imagine, what I imagine they're like. It's all transactions. Um, and there's no real downside to them of being a jerk because, you know, it's all just transactions. Um, and in EOS, it's much more about relationships. We tend to be more constructive. We tend to be more cooperative. The block producers have to work together uh, to even do their jobs. Uh, and so we continually see, you know, thought leader block producers helping the other ones debug things, helping them to write software, helping with tools. Uh, and so we are rapidly creating um, a an ever-growing core of good software tools and good practices just at the block producer level. Um, DAP's a little less so because there is more competition there and a little less room for cooperation, but even there, the ethos of respect and cooperation is very strong. Uh, the governance channel on Telegram, I think a lot of folks have said it's their favorite channel to read because it is so constructive, usually. And I think that has a little to do with my heavy handed and authoritarian rule uh, as a moderator. Uh, and it also has to do, I think with um, having attracted a bunch of people who are committed to true dialogue and a dialogue involves listening to the other person. And when you don't understand them, you don't just assume that they're wrong and say, no, you're wrong. What you say is, yeah, I'm not following you yet. Um, can you say more about this thing? and actually meaning that and actually wanting them to explain to you. Uh, and so we have some terrific conversations on there. I, I, and, and they help pull me up and so that I can maintain those standards too. Um, I'm, I'm in there. That's what I, lo I, I love the cooperation. I love the, uh, the curiosity and the self-discipline. Um, my least favorite thing is, um, when that falls apart, when people start assuming negative intention or they try to build on undefined concepts, um, I blame myself for at least one of those. We're having a uh, pretty sharp disagreement on where to have arbitration, if we need arbitration at the quote unquote base layer, or if we can just stick with arbitration at the DAP level. And no one's actually defined what base layer even means. And I never asked. And I feel stupid that I only recently asked that question. Um, but yeah, building on undefined concepts and, and jumping to disagreement before you're, you're curious. That's my, my least favorite thing. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often. 100%. I'm in there all the time. I'm, I'm not necessarily an active contributor, but I do consume a lot of the information in there. And I think that it's 3,100 people in the gov channel. And, uh, I consider, I consider it the, the, the single best uh, telegram channel out there. Absolutely. The best, the best place to kind of have your finger on the pulse, so to speak. Um, I am going to ask you about this. I haven't, I, I noticed it I did creep your LinkedIn. It's one of the things that I tend to do before we chat. And I noticed that you've been working on a new project known as strong yes. block. Are strong able, block. Are you able to speak on that? Um, I can tell you a few things about strong block. Strong block is headed by David Moss, who you, I mentioned earlier in the show as the guy uh, took Edmunds.com for instance to 140 people and uh, a profitable project in 14 months. Um, and we're in stealth mode. It's a startup with um, six former Block One employees and or contractors, uh, including me and Dave, uh, Corey Letterer, um, Brian Abramson, a couple of others, real rock stars. Um, and we were given a green light to uh, depart amicably from Block One and do this startup. Uh, we were talking about it back in February and March. So it's been long planned and we're working on the white paper. In fact, I'll be spending today on the pitch deck and um, 
I'm really looking forward to being able to talk about it. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk about it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to ask one last question. It's kind of a, it's, it's a little bit of a heavy one, but you spoke in Martin's interview as well, which I thoroughly enjoyed about the fact that fiat may, may conceivably, may not conceivably be a thing in 20 years. Um, do you think it'll have a strong role in the economy? Do you think it'll be around? Uh, what are kind of your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, fiat currency. I'm not a currency guy. Uh, it's not a strength of mine. Um, it doesn't mean I can't have an opinion. It does mean you should not pay too much attention to my opinion. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't mind putting down. Um, let's see. How, how do I phrase the bet? Um, I will claim that fiat will still be relevant. Um, and I will bet you a million dollars US that the dollar is still around which means if I'm wrong, I owe you a million useless, meaningless, empty dollars, which I could probably get for pennies on the black market. And if I'm right, you would owe me a million valuable US dollars. So you shouldn't take that bet. Uh, I think fiat, you know, it, its existence flows from the coercive power of governments. And as long as we have governments with coercive power, we will have fiat in some form, whether it's a crypto fiat or a, uh, non-crypto is irrelevant. So yeah, I think we will still have nation states and they will still have coercive power and therefore we'll still have fiat. So I don't know if there'll be anything like they are today. I think that that's a great answer and um, I actually particularly enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I concur with you. I think the future is coming and it's coming at lightning speed. I want to take the time to thank you, but before I do so, I'd love to know um, where can people find you? Where can people track you down if they want to get involved? ask you questions or be a part of some of the governance chats and, um, and then kind of hear what you have going on. Upcoming. Yeah. Uh, encourage people to join the telegram, uh, channel for governance. Uh, it's, uh, EOS, E O S G O V. Uh, if you want to talk about governance, if you don't want to talk about governance, please stay out of the channel. Uh, if you want to track me, I'm T B C O X. That's Tango Bravo, Charlie Oscar X-ray, uh, on Twitter. And that's probably the best place to find me. And then there's links in my profile to other things. Of course. Thomas, thank you once again. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today. Very much my pleasure. And I'll repeat, anybody wants to interview me, just ask. Um, it may be hard to schedule, uh, but I will absolutely do it if I possibly, possibly can. It wasn't, it wasn't that hard for me. And Matt's my proof point because he asked me, what, three days ago. I did indeed. And, I was and here we are recording it. Pretty cool. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked, but it's been, an, it's been an honor and it's been a pleasure and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon, Thomas. I appreciate everything you do for the community and uh, appreciate you as a human being. I hope we can do it again sometime soon. Thank you. Me too. Bye. Take care, Thomas. <laughs>